Gentlemen, week two. So if you didn't catch us last week, and uh, I think we named the topic of these videos Chats with Docs or Docs Who Chat or something like that. Riker came up with something clever. I can't remember what he came up with. I like it. It's got a nice one to it. Yeah. So good. today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, something that we're seeing uh, across the board with our members. Um, now that we're you know kind of deep into essentially week five of uh, isolation and, and that's lower back pain chad you last week we uh posted or i guess yeah last week we posted uh, a blog post that you had written for us regarding lower back pain and i want to know like now that you guys are doing telehealth and that you guys are online uh providing care is this like probably one of the more common things that you guys are seeing coming in through the office right now is back pain. Tee it up, Chad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not just now, like in general sense, I think that the biggest thing that, you know, we always see is kind of low back pain. And, you know, the biggest thing, reason why we see it is because what positions we put ourselves throughout the whole day, right? Um, you know, generally speaking, um, most of us are kind of sitters for the most part of the day. And, you know, that kind of strain on our back tissues is just putting a lot of, you know, put our uh, kind of back in a vulnerable situation through, you know, whatever kind of other exercises that we decide to do later in the day. Yeah, we're, uh, we're eventually evolving back to the ground, it seems like. Like Chad yeah. said, we sit a lot and unfortunately it's part of what we do. But uh, Dave, to speak to what you were saying with telehealth 100%, I think what's happening now is that people are home a lot more. They're working from home. Um, I alluded to this last week with the uh, Netflix marathons. I mean, it's real deal. And so, you know, over the last couple of weeks, uh, a lot of the cases I work with has been acute low back pain as a result of people loading more uh, than they typically do. And if you think about it, once again, we, we talked a little bit last week, load can be a 400 pound barbell where you're not lifting it properly off a floor or a load can be sitting in a soft, fluffy, I love you couch uh, for four hours straight. You'll still get to the same place where you're loading the structures of your low back and your spine. Um, and then the outcome can sometimes be exactly the same where you get that one instance of sharp pain. It might be getting up off that couch or the toilet or, you know, we, we've heard about everything. So. But yeah, it definitely it's 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 a little bit more prevalent now that people are at home for sure. And, and we typically see the second one more than the first one, right? So it's usually you know like the big fluffy coach that you're sitting there for eight hours a day is what we usually come through. And then they're saying like, oh, well, I reached for that pencil or I reached for that or you know I bent over and picked up my kid and my back hurt. You know my back's all of a sudden shot, and you know but it's what you just did eight hours prior. Yeah, and Chad, in your blog post, which I'm going to. A link to this video when we posted we talked about two different forms of back pain mechanical and discogenic so when we look at those two different forms which one are we speaking of right now uh, both realistically um, you know you know what, what we learn in school is typically um, a lot of extension exercise or extension um, injuries so when we're extending our back up it's kind of typically like the mechanical stuff and then the flexion forward typically we see is kind of a disc stuff but you know as you get into practice you realize that's kind of not the sense of things right you can have both mechanical and disc injuries kind of flexing forward and kind of both extending back and that's what we see a lot in the clinic is we typically see a lot of extension um injuries uh like disc injuries uh that you know we originally think that it could be mechanical, but it ends up being always disc. And I say more than not, we usually see disc. It's always the disc at some point. Um, but it, it kind of goes hand in hand with kind of both, you know, you have a disc injury and yet the structures around it are kind of getting fired up and everything like that. And that's what um, kind of mimics kind of that mechanical pain as well. Warren, you want to add anything to that or? Yeah, yeah, exactly what you said. You, you can be dealing with one or the other or both. And, and the thing is, Dave, and kind of when we came in and did that seminar um, a while back, one of the things that we had to keep in perspective here is that we're not really differentiating one versus the other. Like this is really a spectrum of back pain. And, and so really, you know, we can be dealing with something that's discogenic or we can be dealing with something that's mechanical more so from our lifting mechanics. But at the end of the day, oftentimes the movement patterns and what we're doing, we're loading the same. I know that sounds a little bit confusing, um, but if you think about it, the general rule school of thought is when we're loading the posterior part of our spine, the posterior elements, that's our facet joints 
our deep muscles that stabilize our spine, our ligaments. Um, that, that's more of like a mechanical nature. When we're loading the disc space, you know, um, like Chad alluded to, that's more of a flexion-based injury. However, the disc also has a posterior portion, um, it, w which can really, so as you can see, it becomes, it becomes, you know, it, it can be a little bit confusing, but really it just comes down to looking at function, watching someone move and, and just coming up with the fix. So we're not really concerned about coming up with a definitive structure, if that makes sense. It, I mean, it certainly makes sense to me. Um, I mean, most of the people that are going to be viewing this are also going to have a pretty good understanding that flat, like a lot of flexion, especially when lifting, is typically leading to back pain. I think that where there's a bigger disconnect is around that extension aspect. And it's actually something that we see from a, a back injury perspective, we see a lot more extension issues within blended than we see flexion issues. 100%, and that's across the board. That that's you know that's any sport. If it's if it's CrossFit, if it's weight uh, Olympic weightlifting, if it's hockey, sprinting, and yoga. we, yeah, everything we do is more extension based. Yeah. And if you think about it, without going on, um, you know, some of the preemptive prerequisites, for example, and we talked about this to go overhead with a barbell or a dumbbell. If you don't have proper shoulder range, if you can't get your shoulder or your hand overhead, where do you get it? You start leaking through spinal extension. On a similar point, if you don't have proper dorsiflexion of your ankle, so that would be if you're sitting or, you know, if you're doing a calf stretch, essentially that's, that's dorsiflexion where we're kind of bending through the ankle. If we can't do that in a squat position and we can't get our knee over our foot, then what we do is we sit back in our, in our squat more, which tends us, you know, then we get that inherent lumbar spine to get extension. So there's so many prerequisites that are required to move properly. And the unfortunate thing is the fallback always seems to be we can cheat with spinal extension. And that's why it gets us in a lot of trouble for sure. Yeah, and I just wanna add like, uh, especially what you see in the gym typically, Dave, is like every power move that you guys are taught is you know hip mechanics of driving the hips forward, right, as well. And if you can't drive those hips forward due to the lack of hip mobility or anything like that, what's going to be driving forward. It's also our lower back, right? So you see that a lot on the cleans and the snatches and stuff like that. When you're trying to drive the hips forward, you know, people are overemphasizing that. And what happens is you're just driving that low back into an extension over and over and over again. Yeah, and I, and I, I would say that the one thing that I want to emphasize as we have this discussion tonight is around the fact that although the scenario we're in right now with COVID-19 is, extremely unfortunate the reality is is that you know even when we look at your blog post chat is there is a lot that we can do at home with very little equipment that can prepare us to create a better foundation before we head back from the gym in the next number of weeks um, and Ch Chad you address some of these um, in your blog post but the big part is, is telehealth, your guys' ability to be able to now go online to have these virtual conversations. I think the, 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 uh, the big takeaway is that it's really a matter of assessing, to your point, Warren, what is, where is that issue coming from? The issue is the lower back, but it's typically not coming from the lower back. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Uh, and, and once, like everything we just talked about, you know, it can be with a lift, as in Chad talked about with tension through the hips. You know, we see people not only um, not having good spine posture, and, and just to rewind for a sec, Dave, I just made a note, I want to be clear about this. If we think about what we're dealing with now, which is more home sitting, we probably are dealing with a more flexion based load. Because what we're seeing is that people, uh, and, and actually, it's a two part thing. People who are sitting in couches and, and watching TV and putting their feet up on a table, inherently what we're doing is we're taking our spine and our pelvis and we're doing what we call posterior tilts or we're flexing, we're dumping our back or our bum into the in these soft chairs or couches. And so that is the number one thing probably we're dealing more so now, which is a little bit different than you know when we're, we're in a gym and we're lifting heavy load. But the other thing is we also see people sitting in office chairs at home that probably aren't ideal and we do, you know, we start perching. Uh, on the front of a chair, or you know what I mean? So I don't know if you guys know what I, what I mean by perching, but if I'm just contacting the very front of a seat and I start to anteriorly tilt my pelvis or hyperextend or perch, we also see that in, a, in an office chair, end of a couch type setting. 
So those would be the two most common mechanisms. So once again, dumping your bum and pelvis into a chair, number one. Number two would be sitting on the front of a chair and perching or letting everything dump into extension. Sorry, I, I just- A lot of people head into that perching position because they're yes. actually trying to prevent themselves from hurting themselves. Exactly, Dave. That's 100%. People think it's a better position. And then, you know, we get the, and Chad, you, you'd feel this question as well. Hey, what do you think about me sitting on a physio ball or a Swiss ball? And I'm like, well, yeah, it's great, but it's going to drive you to extension until the cows come home. Because naturally, yeah. it puts you into that perched, anterior tilted, compress your spine uh, position. Yeah. So anyways, I didn't mean to go off there. I just want to be clear. Like, that's the two things that I want people to be aware of when we're at home. No dumping into couches and no perching on, on the front of chairs. So Sorry. what is the actual position that they should be getting into? And how do they do it? Somewhere in between. And and this is, believe it or not, this is way easier when someone's having an acute pain pattern because your spine will naturally tell you. So if you perch on the side of a chair, and, and I know Nick, our physio, he's really good at, he uses a mechanism where he'll get you to drive the extremes of both ranges to the place where you feel almost like it's not a great position to be in or a little bit of discomfort. And then you kind of find yourself right to the middle ground. And so a good idea would be to kind of play with the range and then essentially you'll find a spot in the middle where you feel like you're home or you feel like it's very comfortable. That is probably your neutral spine where you want to live. And then the other tip would be don't be shy to put something in the small of your back as long as it's not pushing you into extension, like it's not overkill. But if you can put a little pillow or something, if you're in a chair or a couch, just to give you that little bit of support, because ideally when we sit and when we have to sit for a long time, we want to be lazy, believe it or not. So we want to get our bum in the back of a chair. We want to use a backrest and we want to relax because the more we try and keep ourselves in the position, you're co-contracting all your trunk musculature around your spine and you're causing compression. And that's the thing that two hours later after sitting, you go to get up and you're like, holy, you know, my back, you get that deep seated achy. Um, and so really there is that sweet spot. And the key is, is to find it technically without having to keep, uh, have your muscles keep you there. So the best way we can set a chair up, we want to be lazy is, is the key, but lazy in a good position. And yeah, and I just, sorry, Dave, just uh-huh. before like, just going back on a point of Warren is when he was talking about finding that neutral position, that's, that's neutral position for you, right? So each of us are kind of anatomically different, right? So what's neutral for you, Dave, might not be neutral for me. Maybe I have techni- like a little bit more of an anterior tilt just naturally in my kind of spine at this point. And like, you gotta find that way where you feel the less tension is kind of the key, right? Like you should feel neutral to yourself. Don't look in a mirror and be like, oh, that's neutral. It should feel neutral, you know? And like, don't don't compare with your, you know, whoever your roommate at this time or the person that you're locked up with. It should feel neutral to you. Everyone's their roommate at this point. Yeah, I know. I don't know that. That's a really good point because there's so much content right now that we're absorbing online. And, yeah. you know, the reality of it is, is no matter what we look at, there is no one size fits all uh, when it comes to this stuff. Now, Chad, I do want to um, kind of come back to a point you made earlier, and that was in t- like today we're in a position where we're spending so much time seated, and then we're moving into exercise, right? And so it's typically once we begin exercise where we feel the pain or we do hurt ourselves due to the fact that we are seated so long. What are some of the things that you would recommend um, people to be doing prior to exercise especially like things like running like a lot of people are running right now especially as the weather is getting better what can we do in our warm-ups in order to help undo the damage that we've done um, in throughout the course of the day by sitting so much i think i think we touched on it last week and remember this morning is uh <clears throat> like the first thing people do remember our, our spines are meant to flex and extend especially our low back like that's pretty much their purpose right so there should be a range there so the biggest best thing we can do is the cat camels you know what i mean just getting the normal motion of our spine kind of going back and forth right and that's probably one of the best exercises you can do prior to being in one static position any longer because it puts you through that full range of motion both ways right and then from there like if i mean it, you your example is running right and we said like i mean I'll actually be writing a blog probably in the future about hips, but hips have a lot to do with what our low back does, right? You know, everything kind of dumps into the low back. So if we get hip tightness or if we got upper T or upper thoracic tightness, it all kind of dumps into that low back. 
So the next thing I would do is just kind of make sure that our hips and everything are activated and feeling great and allowing to move because at the end of the day, our low backs meant, yes, it is meant to move, but it's meant to be a stable joint. Whereas our hips are meant to be the ones that are supposed to be moving. And if our hips don't move, our low back kind of takes the brunt of it. Right? So that'd be the next thing I would do. Warren, you want to add anything? A or? lot of us are also lunging right now more than we typically do, due to the fact that it's such a, you know, accessible exercise at home. Um, and you know, whether it's a body weight lunge or using, you know, uh, some dumbbells or objects like that and address lunging in this same context. Cause it's also comes with a number of lower back issues. For sure. And, and the biggest problem is when we lunge, we stress a lot of our hip flexors, right? So you're looking at like all that front hip flexors. I think if any of you guys have been to our clinic, we talked about the iliopsoas quite a bit with us and all of those adductors. So like all your kind of like inner thigh muscles, right? And all those muscles, you know, are being stressed in that kind of lunge position. They all attach to the pelvis. And what happens is if this is our pelvis and this is your lever, and when you kind of keep stressing those, that pulls the pelvis down into kind of like the front of the pelvis down, right? Kind of into that like extension. And what happens is we're kind of extending through the low back. So if the front of the pelvis is being pulled down, then the low back gets into kind of an arch, which is kind of causing that extension kind of pain that we got going on. Dave, I'd like to hop in here. You know, this is kind of one of my babies that I like to talk about with respect to the lunch and you're smiling because you know where I'm going to go with this. Yeah. It, on top of what Chad's saying here, let's talk about the lunch for a second, the mechanics of the lunch. And we're not going to go on a tangent, but just a little bit. When we lunch, inherently, if we don't have mobility in our hip, and we're not going to get that just by doing 90, 90 for 10 minutes, you know, it, it's a process that takes time. So in the meantime, if we don't have proper hip extension, uh, especially when we look at our trail hip. And I think everybody knows when we look at a lunge, we look at our front hip, our trail hip, it's like a split stance position. What we want to think about doing is a lunge is a terrible name. When we, when we get in that stance and we start to get into this progression, we're not lunging forward. The goal isn't to lunge your front knee past, past your front foot. What we want to think about doing is going straight down into the motion. And so one of the things that Dave and I, you and I have talked about to the extent, shorten your stride a little bit. You know, all you have to do is shorten your stride we get more on that nice vertical, that 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 dip in that nice kind of horse or vertical movement, and you're taking so much stress out of your back. Like Chad said, if you don't have the hip or if you're ten, if you're tight, as soon as you start, you know, you open up the stride, you're going to inherently need lumbar spine extension to get into that motion. Shorten it up a little bit and visualize loading your front hip. You know, you're not trying to stress the back, the trail leg. We're trying to load that front hip. We're going down and we're going up. And if it's a step progression, you step. You move, you come back, and you step. Don't try to do everything in one motion because inherently you're going to lose that, that connection and you're going to start to dump through your lumbar spine. So step, move, back, and step. So you're almost thinking about one, two, three, four. And if you don't have good lumbar pelvic control or you have tight hips, it's going to keep you safe and you can lunge till the cows come home and you're not going to load your spine. Sorry about that. No, that's fantastic. I mean, we no, are fine. We see that more in a walking lunge um, or even a step forward lunge than what we do in a step back lunge. Um, yeah. With the step back lunge, it, it loads more of our quad typically. And like in, in the standard person that we watch move through a lunge, a step back lunge is a little bit more quad dominant uh, because it puts them in a little bit more of an upright position than a, than a forward lunge because we end up um lunging as you say it is like really truly lunging forward right and the other thing is too dave with a reverse lunge people aren't going to step the same you know what i mean like they don't have that same con like so they're naturally when you do a reverse movement your strut you're going to shorten your stride a little bit and the other thing is when you say lunging you can stay upright but it's okay to have a little flexion angle through your hips because if you bend forward a little bit in the lunge you're actually opening up your lumbar spine because the joints live on the back so inherently if I'm lunging and I bend just forward, not through my back, but through my hip, if I do a little bit of a hip hinge, I'm gonna take a little stress out of that back. And a lot of the literature shows us it's actually an advantageous, you, cause you'll get a little tension through the posterior chain and you'll actually help to activate your hip a little bit more. So we want you upright, chest forward upright, but it is okay to, to kind of hinge a little bit through the hip cause you're gonna open up your facet joints just a little and you, you will get a little preload through that, that posterior chain for sure. <clears throat> 
So let's assume that someone has a has back pain right now, over and above their ability to now connect with you guys through telehealth at Proactive, is what are the different ways that we can start leading them towards strengthening their back? So like Cat Campbell's a great way to get your back moving in, in a warm up so that there's like movement through all vertebrae. But what are this, like, you know, typically a lot of people end up, they're like, I need to strengthen my core and they head towards like a sit up. But as we know, that's not our answer. So what are your guys' favorite um, go-to exercises to help manage that issue? You want, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, honestly, the initial one that we, I typically use on any back pain, one, because it, it gets their pelvis kind of in that neutral position or what they feel is neutral, um, is kind of a, like a dead bug with kind of some activation either with a band or Swiss ball, depending on what they have, right? So if we all know kind of what a dead bug um, position is, pretty much you're laying on your back with uh typically if we can get you uh we get all fours kind of into uh like your so your legs are kind of at a 90 90 with your arms kind of up front and what we like to do is we like to get a swiss ball or some form of some massive object in between both positions and getting you to kind of squeeze that um and then what by squeezing it both with your knees and your arms together what happens is is your pelvis kind of gets into a nice neutral position and you're contracting your core. Once we get you into there, a nice progression from there is just simple, just raise an arm off the ground, right? So now you don't have as much pressure and you get to try to maintain it with the other limbs. And then you can kind of go right around the circle. You can take another arm off, you can take legs off. It depends on what you want, but from there is great. Now, if you don't have a large object, sorry, Warren, no. uh, you can use bands, right? Bands can do a very similar thing. So if you have a so if you have a band, if you have a band, a band direction, and you can just wrap it around your arms and bring it forward, and same thing around like your toes, you can kind of create that same kind of thing where you're trying to pull arms and knees and everything together, you know, while contracting that core. And that's that's honestly probably my number one um, progression or where I would start after a low back pain, no matter what the injury is, you know, if I'm looking at disc or, or mechanical or anything like that. And I, and I would just add, depending on the type of back pain, so what we're typically seeing now is acute. We're seeing episodic where people are at home, they're loading their backs differently and they're getting that acute, sharp, like, you know, uncomfortable taking you down and out back pain. So number one, walking. What we have to understand yeah. is that as soon as we get that acute low back pain, you need to walk. So you can go outside, walk around your block, staying within the tolerance of your back. But what you're going to do is you're naturally going to pump your back. You're going to get the inflammation out of your back and you're going to feel better. Once again, you look at your watch, you stay within the tolerance. So if you walk for five minutes and then you start to get spiky, then you're done. Take a little break, get yourself home. And then over time, you want to increase the tolerance. And then secondly, um, and we're all aware with acute low back pain, a guy, Stuart McGill, he's pretty much a genius when it comes to mechanical low back pain and rebuilding backs. So the McGill Big Three, Dave, I know you're a fan. I'm a super fan as well, especially with acute low back pain. What we have to understand is that Stewie developed these drills for people who are coming out of an acute low back pain episode, and they're very much baseline. So someone who is kind of down and out, these are really nice, gentle progressions we start with. A basic curl up where we're in the hook line position, our feet are on the floor, and then obviously we're laying on our back and we're barely lifting our ears stay over our shoulders, cross our arms, we're barely leaving the floor. We're just getting a little bit of activation through our trunk or belly. The other one would be a side plank, making sure our shoulders in a good position. Maybe start from our knees. Bend our knees at 90, we're planking up on our knees. Once we can get to eight to 10, you know, 15 seconds, then we can progress out into our feet. Remember with any type of planking, you know, it, we, could, we could keep ourselves in a position for minutes and minutes if we want, but what are we trying to accomplish? Remember when we're planking, what we're looking to do is activate and, and, and get our stability muscles doing what we need to do. So once we get to the point where we start fasciculating and shaking and you can feel your lat and your, everything is turning on, your big muscles are taking over the job of the spinal stabilizers. So we're not training what we want to train. So as soon as we get to that point, we pop down, we break and we do it again. And then the last one will be our bird dog. I'm a fan of just starting with hip extension as Dave knows, as compared to doing uh, cross crawl both limbs, because inherently, we all want to extend our lumbar spine a little bit more when we do that movement. So Dave, walking in the big three for the people right now who are home in crisis, 
definitely as much as we can tolerate, um, that's that's where we'd start. I love it. Chad just texted and he said his computer crashed. <laughs> he ran into something. Yeah, we're not tech savvy. We've realized that over the last three weeks. <laughs> my man. Hey. Look who's back. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Walking is number one. You need to walk. You need to stay mobile. And number two would be the early progressions of the big three. And then even like Chad said, dead bug, you can go very modest progressions at the beginning. Those are really nice building blocks to get into some more advanced things. And the beautiful thing is if we have a band, tie it on into your band, close your door on it. You can make a system so easy to give yourself resistance. Like Chad said, if you want to pull it off the door and, and give yourself some some extension moment, you know, like it, it's a really easy thing to do. So yeah, but well, that's a great question, Dave. And I think that that would be, that would be the go-to homework for sure. And that's what I, that's what we've been talking about with people who are down and out. That's awesome. Uh, any final words on back pain as we uh, sign off for another week? I just want to one more time talk about do not, and you know, whoever watches this, we got a lot of friends out there and maybe people who we don't know, but my advice would be the same. Do not dump your bum into soft chairs and do not perch on the end of your chair into extension and get up and move. You got to get out. You got to walk. You got to stay mobile. Outside, we can all crush ourselves for an hour, get the sweat on, feel unbelievable, but that's one hour and 23. And then we look at sleeping posture. We look at what we're doing. One hour and 23 is not enough. Like Chad said, periodically pop down in the quadruped position and lube your spine. Just do some cat cow. You should do that three, four times a day. Keep your back moving. I assure you, this the the shitty low grade back belt line tension that we're all feeling, well, you'll start feeling human again. And that's my that's my final thought. For that. I think I think my final thought is uh, you know is after a good conversation with uh, Warren was so the difference between when to when to be in a good kind of load pickup position and when not to be right like like i said our, our backs are meant to flex and extend so if you're bending over and you're picking up shoes or tying on stuff like that like allow the back to kind of round allow it to kind of flex forward and be in a nice position because that's what it's meant to do underneath that when you're then going to pick up load make sure you're in a nice stable position you know we're, we're not kind of flexing forward we're keeping our hips going back and in a good hip hinge and stuff like that so you got to understand the difference between the two. And I mentioned it in the blog, like there is a big difference, right? And, and our back should be able to do both. So don't think every time you pick up that, you know, that crumb off the floor that you have to be in this crazy, you know, hip hinge, you know, like, like I'm deadlifting 400 pounds position because at the end of the day, that's, you don't have to be right. Our, our backs are meant to be flexed forward. That's kind of that position. And if you're loading, like, the, like uh, Warren said, if you're contracting everything, every time you pick something up, that's also putting load underneath that disc and we don't need that right it's meant to be nice and relaxed it's meant to breathe pick it up and then but if you're going in the back and picking up that tire or something that's when you have to load okay that's that's a load so you have to you know keep the load nice and close to your body hip hinge and bring the the you know the butt back and pick it up and, and that there's a big difference between the two hey can i throw my line in yeah i like we, your line we don't deadlift toilet seats that's, that's that. it now with that being said if you do wake up and like chad said you reach for something and you get that acute low back pain it's okay to brace and keep your spine neutral for a couple days but like chad said when you start feeling better you have to get back into using your back the, the way it's been built and, and, and meant to you or the way we're supposed to use it so um but for those first acute couple days for sure you can brace and stay neutral but ultimately you need to get back to proper spinal mobility and function one well, on, what do you think of the Jefferson curl then? That's a, you know what, we can do a whole podcast. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> it really depends on what you do in life. So if you need to sit with a bunch of load and segment your back, and that's something that you need to do, then maybe you can look at doing the Jefferson. But I think, uh, you know, for, for, for fun or for training, not to say that it's not effective and I don't even want to go into it. We really could do a podcast. There is room for it, I think, like for light load and just because it can actually help us segment and feel the segments in her back. So okay. people are- Body weight, Jefferson curl. Yeah. Yes, or yeah. something very light. Just 
because it's a mechanical cue that allows you to feel your anatomy better, right? And, like, it's, and, and it's and it's building up a little bit of tissue tolerance. I yeah. mean, in in slow progression. But the problem is, look what I mean. We like you said, you could do a whole podcast on it. But the problem is, is throwing a bunch of load on and then trying to do that is probably not the best thing for you. Actually, the best thing to do is to walk in when you're cold and grab like the <laughs> and just jump up on the on the block and give her a whirl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure as always. So if someone is um, down and out, how can they reach you? How can they book in for uh, the new telehealth uh, service? That's a great, that's a really good question. Uh, our phone lines are still open. So call the clinic uh, as well as you can contact us directly through our emails. Uh, everything is on our website, but yeah, MJ is up and going. The other thing is we're all doing online booking. Um, so if you just go onto our website, everything, and the only thing we have on the, the website now that's available is virtual care. So we can't get it wrong. Literally you, you get on there, you click on your practitioner. Uh, it's easy, man. Yeah. Dave, thanks so much for having us. We, uh, yeah, yeah. I really